uh, a visual perception from the brain. So uh, a, you if you don't interrupt me too much, then uh, <laughs> then I have a second short presentation tomorrow. Maybe, maybe it could be a nice connection with the next version of the talk So there's a lot of data. We don't have to argue that. Uh, for instance, uh, the Dutch uh, television archives uh, 700,000 uh, hours of uh, video, 100,000 of which are now uh, digital. Um, and it's a completely digital process in the, in the Netherlands. Um, so they add uh, automatically 15,000 hours of uh, video. Uh, surveillance, I computed it. Um, by now, I think it's too low if the, if the number of 40 million uh, surveillance cameras is correct, and so on and so on. YouTube, interesting story. I put this figure uh, to Google. They are secretive about everything. Uh, if you enter the building, even if you take a breath, it's their property. But uh, they didn't want to deny this, but uh, uh, this is three years ago. But uh, after the talk, they came to me, one uh, and another one, in secretive, and they told us it was uh, a factor two off only. So I estimated it myself, but that's three years ago. Um, Earth observation, it's very interesting. There is a lot of satellites and uh, they record everything and nobody knows exactly how many uh, images uh, there are, but they know that only 4% of all images ever recorded from, the, uh, from above is looked at. <coughs> so 96% of the images of Earth's uh, satellites is never looked at. Uh, and they don't, if they fire a rocket with a satellite on it, they don't have a plan for what to do with the data. It's a very interesting phenomenon. Uh, people are funding, people are focusing on firing rockets, not uh, what you do with them. Um, serious social media is to be distinguished from this. This is light social media, as it, uh, that's what you generate. And serious social media is what other people uh, build their business on. For instance, the Dutch train system would be uh, would be likes to very precisely know who are in the train and uh, what, uh, what is the profile of the people in the train. This is also, you could derive this from light social uh, media, but you could also uh, gather it yourself. So there are also, this is a booming business uh, very soon, uh, what I think. Okay. So we are in the business of, uh, for the first part of the talk, we are in the business of recognizing objects. And uh, so basically that returns into the question, what is a car? How do you recognize a car? And Google knows because, in, um, because other people know that, it, that this is a car. That's basically the trick of Google. And uh, they do that very well. I don't have to explain that to you. Um, and, um, and if you ask people, like we, uh, why do they think this is a car? Because they say all sorts of things, like it is brown or it has four legs. Well, I, uh, I would like to put forward to you that uh, not all cows have four legs. This one, for instance, has only two legs. <coughs> it's just about to fall over because it can't stand on its two legs, but uh, the visual portion of this cow only has two legs, right? And uh, not ca all cows are brown and brown, and not all brown is a cow, and not all brown is brown. So it is really, and we can easily, as I will show you later on, uh, recognize this to be a cow. But no modeling, no geometrical modeling uh, a priori, because it will fail absolutely. And given the fact that this is now the success of computer vision, I, I maintain that basically nobody really understands why this is <laughs> recognized as a cow. So whatever understanding may help, I will try to do. There are three main problems when you start to work on uh, object class recognition, and that is that there are very many objects. You can't model them all. There, is a, there are theses uh, in the past appearing uh, on uh, how to detect a tree, and then there would be a thesis on how to detect a clock, and how to detect, so 10,000 theses, because at least a repertoire of 10,000 words is needed here, and uh, you would have 10,000 pieces of software. That's not uh, what you want. So you have to use uh, learning, but the question is then what is your fixed part of your algorithm? <coughs> and the other, so th the modeling problem is one, and the other problem is that, uh, that there is sensory fluctuations. That if you have this package, which is obviously the same as this one, that one, 
that one and that one, it has a million appearances by itself. It only comes, this, these are accidental conditions during the recording. No, so you have to separate that out from the <coughs> next source of variation, which comes in a moment. But many people lump this, confuse this with the, the variation of the thing. Like, oh, sorry, I'm solving this first, but uh, let's solve the, the variation of the thing <coughs> first. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Let's solve this variation first. Um, so, you want to, if you look at this thing, you want to strip off all the accidental conditions of the observation. And uh, it's not only that, uh, that it is advisable for a computer to do, any observation system has to do that, including the eye. So, you want, um, uh, you want to have uh, invariant features. For instance, you think this is brown, this cow, but if you plot it in RGB space, you see this. So what should be a dot in RGB space, because the, obviously the, the, the cow is equally brown everywhere, this is what it really looks like. So if you want to turn this into an invariant, regardless the orientation of the cow relative to the light source and the camera, you have to uh, build in a, uh, a sphere in here and project the grass and the, and the brownness of the cow on the sphere, you get Basically, you get RGB or better uh, invariants, uh, as I will show in a moment. And the tighter the cone is here relative to that, the more discriminatory power you keep in, in telling things apart. So now you strip away. So you, there is RGB. You throw away one dimension of RGB. You keep two dimensions, but you strip uh, many of the accidental conditions. <coughs> Okay, so this is one class of variant, shade invariant. Uh, this is uh, uh, matte planar uh, objects, uh, and this is for uh, monochromatic light uh, invariant. So, there are several types of invariants, measuring increasingly large number of uh, classes of invariants, uh, which you can use. And I'm pretty sure that in the retina, all these invariants are being measured. And depending on, the, on what you see and what you estimate the conditions are, this one is given preference. So, sorry. What is E lambda? Sorry? What is E lambda? It's the derivative of the intensity relative to lambda. Now, in the lambda dimension, we only have three observations, RGB, but never that had, we, had we had more, like sea animals uh, used to have, like seven, then you could measure it more accurately, but this is basically derivative of that relative to lambda. So, <coughs> next generations, uh, 20 years from now, uh, cameras will have uh, 256 uh, uh, sensors in the lambda dimension, simply to measure this quantity better. But humans only need three, apparently. Okay. So now, we've, by using color, there are also other things. Uh, we've stripped off accidental conditions of the of the moment of observation. What remains is, this is a mill, and we can easily recognize it by now as a mill, even if you've never seen it. Like you have not seen it, but the computer can also recognize this, given the, uh, given, uh, the fact that you've learned it from, uh, from a few of, of examples. But the, um, by stripping away the sensor uh, variations, you don't you see that this darkness is not essential to the mill, but, uh, but simply to the scene. Okay. So now we have the, what remains is the intrinsic variation of the mill, all the views there are uh, around it, and the, how to summarize it, the essential properties of a mill. Okay. Um, from approximately 2003, Li Fai Fai and the other people, uh, some early, uh, Malik. Basically what you do is you, uh, you sample it, uh, you measure uh, locally many properties, uh, sometimes it's created at a point, sometimes it's just densely, I, I I'll discuss it in a moment, <coughs> you make the, a, a vocabulary, and basically to measure properties you need to have not three parameters at each point, or three features at each point, you need a lot of them in order to be sufficiently robust for all the things you see in life. So typically now, 
the, the number of properties is typically 128 at each pixel uh, point. And then you have an enormously high dimensional feature space, so you create a vocabulary of words, basically that's a projection of a patch of the feature space onto uh, maybe 4,000 different words. Initially there were literal words like sky and a tip of mill and uh, things like that, but now they are abstract words, uh, no, no longer to be precise in that part. So now we've put it, we put the image uh, recognition problem into a similar uh, word recognition uh, problem and from then on we proceed with natural language processing. So we learn the presence of words from examples, we count them and we classify it. That's basically the whole process. So you see there is the, <coughs> there is the, the, the image, you, you inform yourself on the features of each of these patches and then you count, for instance, the most occurring word here would typically be that all of this would be classified as this one and that would be, say, bluish. And all of uh, that part, that would be here and that would be, uh, say, a white brick or something like that. Okay. So we are going to measure uh, uh, SIFT features, but not only SIFT, but also color SIFT and all sorts of variants, and it is stable. The SIFT feature is stable only for the boring uh, pixels in the uh, patches in the image. Only when the patch, the local patch of uh, pixel values is uh, very stable, then the SIFT feature is also very stable. <coughs> and that was not what it was designed for. The SIFT feature was designed to. Uh, to look for salient points, but if you look at the behavior of shift around uh, salient points, it's highly unstable. But if you shift it by one pixel, it can end up somewhere completely uh, different in feature space. <coughs> so, so it is exactly by stability. This is a so it changes the value of the outcome. If you shift the shift feature by one pixel, it may, and if it is salient, if it is, of course, if the data field is very slow, then nothing happens. But for the interesting points, uh, it may end up completely somewhere else in uh, feature space. So it is a real miracle uh, the method works at all. And there is a, well, so it was good luck, so to say. It could have failed here or there, <coughs> let's put it that way. And th that's why, <coughs> in the end, we now do dense shifts, no longer at salient points. Well, what you say would be so unstable, I mean, the bins of the shift, they are like uh, no. no, there are like so eight may, eight. Maybe some of us maybe do not know what SIFT is. Um, uh, I, I, I have to apologize yeah. then. Okay. This is SIFT. So you measure, uh, you measure in a very small patches, you measure the direction of the gradient, and then in such uh, a 2 by 2 environment, you measure the, the amount of gradients there, and this pattern is typically is summarized into a 128 dimensional factor, typically saying that here I see variations, and there's not very structured, so this would represent grass, if you if you with me, or, or water, or very. But if it, there would be, if it would be very upward uh, pointing here, the gradient, then this would be a single ridge uh, image patch. That's basically well, how it works. The second one, uh, you, you will have the gradient in the, no, second row. In the second row, you can understand that there is a gradient in the vertical direction. Yes, yeah. mild gradient. Okay. Now I go back to your question. No, if, if it's two by two, if it's one of those blocks, it's two by two. two, by two. If, if the image shifts only one pixel, yeah. like this, and the, and the heavy gradient from here shifts to there, then already you are way somewhere else in feature space. But in general, uh, neighboring pixels would have similar types of gradients. So no, not, not at saving point. I'll show you uh, examples in a moment. <coughs> um, Okay, so that's why DIFT, which is dense shift, not only restricted to salient points, works much better. And the SERF, which is uh, approximate uh, component of that, not adhering to Gaussian filtering, but just very simple filtering, is good enough. Captures the essence. So, and DERF is the dense representation level. So this, this is basically 
an approximation to that one, and this one is an improvement over that one. <coughs> and uh, DAISY, that's this one, is uh, better founded. We did experiments with it. It takes a lot more computation time. It doesn't bring any improvement. Okay, so if you project back that we recognize this as motorcycles, now the question is where is the evidence positive and where is it negative? Um, positive <laughs> is yellow and the negative is blue. <coughs> so in the end, if you back project all this, you see that here it captures some evidence and here it captures some evidence and here and here. So apparently discriminating in among a class of 20 different object types like uh, motor bicycles, cars, chairs, bottles, that this component of the image, when this occurs, so that is an orient uh, 45 degree angle of black against black, is highly discriminating. You can imagine because it's not happening in a bottle and it will not happening in a ta diner table, dining table, and that this is the way, so it picks out, it sieves out all these things which are discriminating. So that's why we can recognize without further learning, if you have an unknown image of a motor bicycle, it will classify it as a motor bicycle on the basis of it analyzes it everywhere, but here it will find a lot of support for uh, being relatively unique for uh, motor bicycles. And what's more, there is also a, a second uh, thing that it captures in the remaining of the image, it captures so much positive evidence that it uh, also supports uh, the fact that it's a motor bicycle. You see that there is also patches of negative evidence uh, and these patches uh, simply are outweighed by the fact that you've deliberately chosen to have a high dimensional uh, feature space which is enormously uh, correlated, not good advice when I was a PhD student. Uh, it is robust, it will help to cover a lot of uh, different uh, object types without any further learning, but it will, <coughs> but it will uh, focus, but the understanding of why it works, why it deliberately <coughs> sorts out uh, motor bicycles uh, is less, so to say. So this helps, maybe. Um, to uh, visualize why it works. And this is even more clear. This is the standard uh, uh, back of words uh, uh, variation. But, um, that this is a sailing boat. And uh, you, uh, if you imagine uh, boats, boats are enormously variable. So the, basically, a boat, de detect a boat without having a graphical model of each and every one of them will fail. But the constant factor of boats is that they are in the water. <coughs> and the water is much, by far, less variable. So if you capture all the variation in the water and the fact that there is a hole in the water, you have, it's either a refrigerator, <coughs> which should not be there, or it is a boat. Right? So here you see positive evidence everywhere outside the boat, and it contributes to the boat. And you see this portion hugely identifying for a boat. So if you see this and you don't see the rest, you know that there must be a boat underneath it. Whereas the boat itself so much looks like cars or, or, or airplanes that they are, uh, that, uh, the algorithm doesn't know what to do with it other than just uh, rejecting it. Yeah? On the left, uh, on the on left. The left side is even a negative. Yeah, yeah, the boat itself is negative because apparently not very many yellow boats. Uh, yeah? Okay. So we did an experiment. <coughs> I should have. Uh, this is uh, from the proofs of Jasper. I should have. Let me see if I can uh, uh, quickly summarize it for you. A uh, boat, we knew the perfect uh, location of the uh, object. And. Um, so you know that what's in, in the box and out, uh, outside the box. We only use the material in the box. If, uh, and then you see that uh, for both and both, uh, the context does much better. So if you want to classify a boat by the boat, it is just worse than if you classify it by 
the remainder of the, of, of the image. And uh, for bike, uh, car, dog, uh, and table, and things like that, context is totally irrelevant. Why is that? Because a dog appears everywhere. So there's no fixed background. There's no ecosystem around him. He can run everywhere. Yeah. Where his boss is, there is the dog. Is that a property of the data set? Yes, uh, and of reality. Because these are huge data sets. Like uh, taken from Twitter. But yes, it's a, of course, it's a property of the data set. I will come back to that in a little robustness in a moment. And if you know the if you know the exact location of the, then it always improves. Yeah? If you know it exactly, but the problem of segmenting, I haven't discussed it. It's uh, but basically to know it ideally is almost impossible. And when it's uh, when it is known, then context is very important. But then you have to know it ideally. And what I think is that the brain works like this: you know what it is, and then you segment it, not the other way around. We agree on that. Okay. So, if you look at the history uh, of the last uh, eight years, you see that Fergus, uh, the, the one at CDPR, actually the best paper, very influential, he did grouping of events, of visual events. When they were close he and, the, and the events were pointing at the motor bicycle, he called it the motor bicycle. And then salient crept in, formerly phi phi, and then we went to dense sampling, and it increases all the time. And now, of course, you know that with dense sampling, you can never uh, solve the problem entirely. Because if the images get bigger and bigger, then you're losing what you're looking at. Or if you have two objects so similar that they share the same uh, living environment, like a plant and a bottle, they all are in households. So if the household is very important, then you cannot discriminate among them. So now we are reintroducing localization, but in a different way than uh, I'll, I'll show you in a minute. And it's still improving all the time. Okay, so we have learned uh, what to analyze, what features. Now we're going to map it onto the words. And the word is a, is a patch in the feature space, and very high dimensional feature space. Um, and then for the word learning, first Levi Fei introduced real words like sky and tip of mill and, uh, thing, and the, the, she learned examples. Now, then it was uh, for a long time unsupervised, high density with equal diameter, built tricks, and now currently it is supervised again, but not by, uh, but supervised at the level of the images, not at the words. Soft assignment is by all means. Uh, better. Uh, at all levels, soft assignment rather than hard assignment works <coughs> would find it better. This is the typical example of the content of a patch, uh, sorted by SIFT. And there comes your question. It is uh, comfortable that all of these details uh, are very similar to one another. Then you think, well, SIFT works well. But here I didn't show it, I didn't plot it. There are other words which also contains exactly this or that. For our, you would be able to discriminate it visually. But these patches are way somewhere else in feature space. <coughs> so this is words, but only words what the feature space things are similar, not at all uh, according to our human uh, perception. So what we are aiming to do now is to create new words which are different and which, which combine uh, parts of the feature space which only need, uh, so that you have a much uh, smaller vocabulary, maybe uh, a few hundred will do, uh, in order to capture this. So you get a real word which, in after you've learned it, really represents, uh, say, early classicistic uh, gable elements, because they are highly identifying for, uh, for buildings. Uh, we, well, we are busy doing that. This is another <coughs> uh, paper. By uh, So where do you get the examples? Currently you get them from Flickr. You download it. It's corrupt and noisy. But if you have many examples, now typically 5,000 examples per concept, download from uh, Flickr. 
you throw out automatically by looking at it uh, the wrong examples, and then you say, well, this is cheap. And the, so the more, very, the more examples you have, similar as in natural language processing, the better it works. There was an in, this is an enormous uh, performance increase. You can write a paper uh, if you have an increase of, say, 5%. Uh. OK, are we making progress? Yes, we do. There is a TechFit uh, competition on video. And uh, it is, uh, are you familiar with that? You first you get home, sent home uh, 300 hours of video taken from Al Jazeera, CNN, the Dutch television. Uh, and then with, uh, you tune your system and then you get home, sent home a few, uh, uh, a few uh, sets of unknown video and find all the uh, find all the instances they then also identify to you. So you don't know, when preparing the competition, uh, what the things is you are searching for. <coughs> and, <coughs> and the other uh, is it's done by, NET, uh, by NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, and you have to tell how you've done it also. So this is system performance, and you say, well, there is no progress, because uh, every year it's the same uh, performance. Well, that is not exactly the case, because image is getting harder and harder all the time. <coughs> we applied our system of 2006 on the 2000, uh, well, our systems of 2006 and 2009 on the same two data sets. And this is the performance on 20 concepts uh, when trained on the same data set, so BBC data to recognize BBC data, and this is BBC data trained uh, to recognize CNN data. So totally different style of, of recording topics and so on. So you see that even in three years time that the robust, uh, uh, the robustness is now over the performance of the, uh, in, so there is tremendous progress uh, in three years in this uh, competition. And it's demonstrated that if I have, if I type in snow in this system, I get one piece of snow and nine errors. <coughs> if I type in snow here, I get the first seven are snow and the other three are water and mistakes. This is the American flag. This is walking person. This threshold is good enough for uh, interaction. That threshold is good, uh, is performed by Google using other user information. So there are now five concepts which are better than, uh, than uh, Google uh, uh, annotations. B and only derived from the raw data, and the Google annotations come what other people say is in the, uh, is in the Are you going to go into how picture. you did this? Or Sorry? You didn't go into how you did this. I, I, uh, that were all the previous slides. No, no, the previous slides you explained, you explained why bags of words doesn't work, why in, in this area, why the context is important in some cases, why the object. I missed where you explained what you do. Okay. Okay, I, I uh, told it in more detail than I usually do. <laughs> um, are we making progress? Yes, because uh, in the, this is the usual time-consuming uh, bag of words, and this is our current uh, implementation, which only uses 1% accuracy. So basically now we can recognize 20 concepts uh, real-time on a normal uh, laptop. Uh, if you provide uh, it with a stream of video, we recognize 20 concepts. Which 20? Uh, relevant to me. If you provide also uh, some 50 training examples of images. So, so let me try to see if I got your answer. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. Can go back to your answer. So yeah. you still want to understand how to do it. So essentially, a when you say bag of words, what some of us have in mind is, is really a document with words that you Treat independently, and and uh, and then and then essentially compare the statistics of the histogram with words yes. across different concepts. So classes. step number one is you measure properties at each position in the image, and then not only measure uh, uh, several types of color uh, measures with the shift uh, in the shift way, and then you create a vocabulary of words which is patches uh, at the feature space. So there's a huge feature space. It's only a sphere because it's normalized. And this patch 
will map into one word and this will patch will map into another word. Use, it used to be the case that these patches will have a real meaning, but that doesn't work so well, so it's now abstract meanings. And then we count the number of hits in an arbitrary new image, which are in one of those patches. So there will be a lot of uh, patches which count like bluish. And you know that there must be a lot of blue air. Well, not necessarily. You know it could also be something else. But and then you learn that. And then you count the words and you classify an arbitrary image. Basically, that's all there is to it. So the other thing which might be confusing to the number of words in your vocabulary determined by some 4, sort of but it's some sort of quantization of those feature space. Yes. Which you do essentially arbitrarily. Yes. It's better. <coughs> Works better. <coughs> <coughs> and so it's actually no context other than the local connect connectivity or connections in the features themselves. Uh, the, it starts from, uh, say, gradient directions and counting gradient directions. So it's completely localized in the image. Yes. No model of no model of a uh, sheep or whatsoever. Um, this, by localizing it, uh, as we do now, this is uh, current result, no longer uh, on the basis of the entire image, but we are localizing it. Uh, and we, if you now type in person, uh, give me person and sheep, this is the response you get. So this is clearly uh, wrong, but this one, the first three are right. And this is the competition. Well, not too bad. And this is the other competition. Uh, very poor. And that is because this one uh, rests on the entire image. And here you see the response. Um, now, typically, the performance of two is worse than just one, of course, I would say. But you see that uh, this, is, well, this is, a is, a, is already a serious improvement. If you go from there to there, that's uh, that's an enormous. Uh, I know that in yes. This graph, you have uh, in each row uh, different concepts. So you have car uh, plus yes, okay. complete, car, car plus dog, uh, pairs. Okay, pairs of concepts. Pairs of concepts, like uh, a dog and something I can't read myself, but it, mm -hmm. it only shows. Where does come from? The new technique. Um, so they are from Pascal. Uh, from 2010. And, and even you have a reasonable success with triplets. So if you fire chair plus dining table plus potted plant on the data set, you get that for a response in our system and you get this response uh, with the usual way of doing it. And uh, here you have car and horse and person. And what we aim to do is to tell the story of an image. That if you have a person on an image, it doesn't say you very much. If you have car plus horse plus person, it tells you these are uh, images which much more uh, capture the total story of the image. So to say. So you see that in general now with triplets, it's moving backwards, so it's very hard to find them all. But nevertheless, uh, the progress relative to other approaches is substantial. Let me see if I can start this one. And uh, this is how it works in practice. Uh, now this is for video streams and it automatically uh, generates uh, not only from other uh, companies, not only uh, it turns the voice into a streaming text, but also it uh, automatically classifies uh, the content of the video while it's coming in. Sorry? The speech recognition is done. No, it's not by me. It's by uh, TNO. Uh, this was a result of a Dutch project, actually. And the, the company, uh, UV, that's my company, we do the, the labeling of, uh, of concepts. Why does it work? Because there was over competition. Of course, we moved from focusing on a specific location of an object to the best window because we used many invariant features because we learn uh, semantics uh, and we do not learn uh, the model, uh, so we transposed it into, uh, uh, into natural language processing and we use more of many and then uh, by using approximate methods 
and go uh, faster and almost as good, as a consequence of which if you go faster you can exchange something, uh, you give, give something back and analyze more. And that's basically what we do on a VO. So now, uh, and we use uh, social uh, sites as Flickr to get examples, we improve them a bit and then uh, you can have more uh, uh, examples for free. Yeah? Yes, so it, you can use a very detailed Gaussian filter, or you can have a recursive approximation to the Gaussian filter, which runs a uh, hundred times faster and is only five percent off the Gaussian filter. But the method doesn't, ma doesn't so that's one. Yeah? And there are many other, like we use uh, random forest rather than nearest neighbor, is uh, 50 times faster to uh, implement. So these all, all, all these types of approximated methods uh, help, <coughs> help you solve the problem. So what I find fascinating is that you turn the image processing or the image object recognition problem into a text analysis and actually use a very crude text analysis method. And this is to beat yeah. all model bases. Uh, so that is basically uh, Lee Kai Kai's uh, contribution. Uh, but, uh, but now we make serious. Uh, let me see if I do. I have time for a uh, contribution on this one. Absolutely. I mean, uh, if you don't have time, I think this is a very good bridge uh, to the next question. Okay. Let me see if I. We also do work uh, on uh, cognitive vision. This is uh, Waibu. Uh, Waibu was a. Uh, uh, an engineer, uh, eventually, of the Royal Swedish Academy. And he was in mental fatigue. He also looked a little bit fatigued uh, to me himself, but maybe he I identified with the topic, I don't know. But he, <coughs> and the Weibull distribution is named after him. And he was, and uh, the Weibull distribution is the same as the Gauss distribution, where the square is replaced by a parameter. So it runs from uh, the power law uh, to the Gaussian distribution, basically. So it's a three-parameter family, uh, the the Weibull uh, distribution. <coughs> so lambda is the exponent. Uh, Sorry. Lambda there is the exponent. Uh, in this case, yes. So I'll, I'll, I'll use a different. I, do, I use a different notation oh. in a moment. But uh, sorry. He observed regularities in the crack intensities of of metal fatigue. And he was so surprised that he did not believe it himself. I can imagine, because I was completely surprised to see this. When I heard, first heard about this, that if you take an arbitrary image, sufficiently complex, you compute uh, the intensity of the gradient, you make a histogram, you get this, it's very close to wider distribution. If you take another arbitrary image, sufficiently complex, you compute the gradients, you plot it, uh, this is the histogram of all gradient intensities, it's also a wider. And in fact, even that one is close to a wider. There's a hump here, but otherwise it's close to one. So the first time I heard this, I also didn't believe the result. <coughs> uh, because why would this where would this come from? The fact that, that some who had designed it such an image, such a way that it exactly would be a wider distribution. No, it's I take intensities and then I compute the gradient. Right, right. No, no structure. Mm -hmm. No. No. So we have a, a, the same distribution. Yeah. All the way. Yeah, I know, I know. There's only three same parameters family, left. Same family. Same, only three parameters left. Intensity, width, and, uh, and the lambda, or the, the beta, as, as it is called in this case. The power. The power is gamma and the beta. Yeah? Is it independent on the x detection of the Sorry? Isn't it depend on the uh, x detection of the Delta? I tell you another story. If you, if you do this for the gradient direction, say, 
Now, if you do it for, uh, for the invariance I just showed you a moment ago, the color invariance, same. But not the same parameters? No, of course not. Not the same parameters. And do you know where it comes from? It took me a while to realize, and also I'm sure Weibull took a long while to realize, that the Weibull distribution is the law of big numbers for correlated data. So if it is for uncorrelated, we only know the uncorrelated version, which is the extreme end of the Weibull distribution, but if the data are correlated, which images are, then the law of big numbers, statisticians know this for ages, is the Weibull distribution. So it has to be like this. So this actually is some sort of the central limit theorem. Yes, and for, the for images. Right. Yeah, I did. Okay. So it doesn't work for this one at all. Because uh, this is the viable, this best fitting viable distribution, and this is the, the. Because it's not sufficiently chaotic, so to say. Yeah? And uh, the, uh, if you apply it on viable himself. And he, uh, he is also uh, adhering to a life, so he's sufficiently complex, right? <laughs> okay. But then, uh, it's also, uh, <coughs> I, I'm sure that uh, it could be demonstrated that uh, it's, it's applicable to every type of image. But in my point of view, this is more important for uh, life science uh, picture from a landscape or natural images. Natural image. Like maybe that one. No, I was wondering what happened instead when uh, we have uh, a target uh, and so your images has uh, not important background, not so complex background, but just for the target, like the, the, the face. So what is yeah, it doesn't work for, uh, say, mountain view if you have a blue sky yeah. and the mountains here, uh, but in, because that basically is a mixture of two wilds. Because the blue sky is very like this and the mountains is very much like a Gaussian. So then, so in the end, every natural picture is a, is a mixture of Weibulls, but uh, according to our belief, at least, um, at least three quarters of any picture of say, um, Flickr or uh, any data set, 70, 75% is strictly Weibull. And then a few of them, uh, which uh, the more artificial or designed ones, or with very, they are either a, um, a mixture of two Gaussians or, or many, in the end of many Gaussians, uh, many Weibulls. This is a data set, and we plotted the data set, and we computed uh, how the, the Weibull distribution, and here you see with large uh, beta, this is, this is the power, this is uh, the gamma, if it is very much, uh, it has many detail, no real focus, uh, very complex scene, it ends up here. If it has one target, it ends up here. So the when, we, when, when we saw this, the observation was, well, then the brain, who is trained in viral statistics all the time, every day, because that's what enters the eye, must also have somewhere a viable computation unit, because then you can have split it into uh, this part goes to the division the of, uh, well, tell me what it is, is it dangerous? And this part goes to, is connected to fall asleep, nothing happening. Yeah, so there must be a sort of brain, a splitter in the brain on the basis, well, there is, we found it. We did uh, experiments and we looked uh, on EEG and we showed 1600 images and 16 subjects and we computed it with uh, functional data analysis <coughs> and we also made a model uh, where is it? yeah, yeah, I'll tell you in a moment <laughs> <coughs> and we also made a model on uh, how you could compute it uh, approximately the Weibull I, I wasn't involved in this but I didn't want to refrain it from you and basically, here it says, this is the response, 55% of the variance uh, explained at 110 uh, microseconds. So it rests uh, very early in the process, basically two clock cycles away. And uh, in, so it is here, this is here, in the back. What do you mean here? In V1, in V1. But, but also it is even more prominent in uh, LNG. Uh, LGM, sorry, where, um, and then later we, find, we found that uh, 
by using this uh, this correlation, we could also demonstrate that uh, at that it even works better if you assume that there is local scale uh, selection in uh, LGN. So you then even the, the explained uh, correlation uh, increases at that point. Almost all early uh, is explained response is explained with local scale control for contrast products. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, how it can help us? If you want to have um, a very, uh, we've also used viable distribution to see where uh, in the image you would draw a focus of attention. Sorry? For silence. For saliency, yes. Because if if Weibull is normal, then breaking from normal, uh, no, uh, breaking from Weibull is abnormal, and that really works. It's not published yet. And also, this work is late in publishing. So you do it locally. You don't do it on the whole image. You do it locally, and locally you compute the Weibull. And if it deviates from Weibull, it must be abnormal, and then uh, and that works indeed. That is. That thesis is about to be concluded. But the, you have to remember that the viable distribution is only after taking away the intensity, only two parameters left, <coughs> which are highly correlated, by the way. So basically, only one parameter, and it can sort out images in, uh, in very busy images and uh, single uh, topic images. That's all there is to it. No, no other finding, but it's only a very simple uh, operation anyway. <coughs> yeah?